All right, I want to make sure we get this recorded. Um, uh, so everyone here has seen Paula Claire's work since the first day of the semester, and uh, we've uh, enjoyed looking uh, at her work. And um, so I don't think I really need to make too much of an introduction, but as you all know, Paula Claire has been an influential member of the concrete poetry scene since the late 60s has exhibited and performed internationally and uh, has, uh, is well represented in the Sackner archive and uh, was actually um, a friend of Marvin and Ruth. So uh, it's uh, really a great honor for us to have her joining uh, the class today. So please welcome Paula Claire. Hey. <laughs> right, can you hear me everyone? Yes. yes. Good. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is hello, Ruth, and hello, Marvin. Because <laughs> to me, people who do such amazing things, their spirits are permanently with us. We have inherited from them this really tremendous resource and it's i'm delighted to be here with you in what is still to me pure magic this zoom system <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to say much more because we're going to focus on the items that you have selected and a lot of information that you i'm sure will be very happy to know is going to come out quite naturally in that way so I don't want to say any more except I'd like to meet the person who chose Greek light to start off our session. Well Paula Claire um, in in order to sort of make um, things simpler uh, I chose the works and we looked at we've looked at uh, a large box of your stuff that you can see here on the table so right. i would say i would say that we sort of coll collectively oh uh, good yes selected, lovely collected the works um yes. but i'm sure um, many people have commented on individual works and we'll have questions so uh, right. I, I think we'll also say that um uh, as you're talking uh, I guess people could raise their hand and we'll, we'll take questions along the way, right? Instead oh, of absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't want it to be something that I'm talking about and then everybody keeps quiet till the end. It's, it's a joint session. We're, we're a team. We're working together to appreciate all the different styles that are in your archive and uh, I am part of. Yeah, so I'm going to share the screen and we'll uh, look yes. at some of the works that we chose. And also, uh, I've got the photos that you um, uh, sent to me that we can reference as well. That's right. That's right. So, so can, ev everyone can see Greek light now, can they? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we, I'm going to pass it around the table as well, just so people can yes. refresh their memory. Good, good. Well, while you're doing that, I'll I'll begin to to talk about this work. I vividly remember still creating this piece. In fact, I gave myself a bit of a fright. I was living in Athens at the time, teaching English under the auspices of the British Council. And I had a college friend with me. We, we'd uh, both graduated from London University and uh, we were very happy in Athens at that time. And of course, English people going to Greece, everybody has the cliché. Oh, it's that light, because here in England, we have many subtle kinds of light, but it doesn't open you up in the way that the Greek light does. And I wanted to express this. And usually, well, up till that time, I had worked in what we call the linear style. That means I was using the Western way of communicating, 
writing words from the top left-hand corner of a page systematically across it down to the bottom. That's the linear grid. Now, all the types of concrete visual poetry show us that there are other ways of expressing language. And I got interested in the history of languages and realized that a lot of other languages, uh, I'm thinking of Farsi, Persian in, in, uh, in particular, they don't do that. They begin from the right and travel across to the left in that way. And uh, in Japanese culture, I learned uh, traditional Japanese began at the top and then went down the page. And my very favorite in learning the history of languages is one called Bustrophidon, which was a Cretan way of putting text down onto a surface. And that literally means how the oxen plow. Well, when you think about it, let's all plow our field with our oxen. You start at the bottom of the field and you work up to the top. And then you think, oh, that's the end of my field. I've got to turn round. And so you turn your oxen round and then you go down parallel to that first line you made. You get bottom to that and then you turn round again. So really you're making a kind of zigzag. And I think all this shows us that there are so many ways of putting language down on the page. So um, this particular piece, I remember creating it, and it is, uh, it doesn't work in this linear way. Okay, I've shown you that um, there are lines across it, but you are asked, you are invited to go across the page, up down again, across and then down in, in a, a non-linear way. And I remember actually creating this in my, uh, flat in Athens and thinking, oh, how strange, you know, oh dear, this, this is very odd. And people are going to think I'm very strange asking you to create uh, to, to put your energies into moving your eyes all over the page. And I, started to call this kind of work mobile poetry. Now, would anybody like to make a comment on that? I'm curious, Paula Claire, uh, uh, did you, um, the red lines, did you make those just with a ruler and a pen? I, obviously it was typed, but then um, the grid itself, did you create, just create that by I, hand? I, I didn't put any lines across it to begin with. I just typed the words and let the eye wander about on the page. And then I decided, well, I, I've done a lot of teaching to students and I, I thought that might help them understand that the eye must jump about from one word to the next. It can go in any direction. And I think at the bottom, I, I did say at that time, I'd like people who read it to use each word in at least twice, but they can choose which, whichever way they want to go. So it was my very beginning of my non-linear style where the linear grid, as we call it, was broken. You made this piece while you were teaching English. Did you show it to your students? Uh, <laughs> No, actually, <laughs> I, I, I was, I was teaching formally at the British Council. Oh, and I, I didn't share my work at that time, my poetry work, not until 1980. I was actually, I, I was in Greece from 64 to 68, and then I uh, came back to Britain. My parents had retired to Oxford and I came to live in Oxford and I've lived here pretty well all the time since then. But in 1980, I got to know a person running the literature department and they actually invited me back to, to Greece and I gave a, 
a lecture on my archive and a performance in Thessaloniki, there, one of their um, offices, and then another performance, a very happy performance in, in Athens. And then, of course, they did hear all about it and they, uh, they, they gave a little brochure about it and said, oh, what is this stuff, concrete poetry? We are dying to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Paula. Okay. I just want to know why you chose those specific words. Like, is it random or is there some meaning behind choosing those words? So the question is uh, the specific words. How did you choose them? Um, what's the significance of those specific words? Oh, well, it's, it tries to convey the shock of brilliant light okay you have to have sunglasses on in in uh, in greece if you've got any sense otherwise you're going to damage your eyes but what impacted me time and time again uh, i used to visit you know the the uh, historic sites and see these great columns rising into the sky but the way that the sun hit that those buildings it it was dazzling and it 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 had this very very powerful effect on you and i wanted to convey that and the eyes retort the eyes retort and it, it's uh, it's so dynamic in a way that in england i'd never experienced okay um i'm curious as to so you just mentioned why maybe you chose these words. I am curious, or I'm very interested in why you chose or um, asked people to start with the word obstructs, um, yes. just because in relationship to thinking about light or the freedom of eye movement, obstructs yes, yes. is like such a counterintuitive word to those kinds of ideas that you're putting forth in this. Um, start with obstructs. Startling, of course. All these words, we we when i when i read it when i perform it there are pauses there are dramatic moments and it the word dazzle the the the, the dazzle 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 white obstructs eyes retort eyes retort eyes it it has all kinds of unexpected rhythms to it and when i begin uh people with me they they just relax into it and 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 they try it again but uh i don't want to spend too much time on this piece because there's so much else to say about all the other ones so uh, as long as you can see that in 1966 i developed this mobile style myself what what was so important was when i then went back to um uh, Oxford in 1968, I nipped up to London to Better Books because that was the bookshop that had a lot of avant-garde material. And um, I found the Anthology of Concrete Poetry, which of course is so famous. It's the Emmett Williams and um, Hanshaw Meyer book. And it has all these different um, experimenters. And I suddenly realized that uh, it, this wasn't a freak of mine, that there were uh, I was part of an international scene of people exploring the the freedom of, of the blank page. The blank page is, is a dynamic field on which words can move. Great. Um, thank you. Well, yes, we, we're gonna run out of time. Uh, Way too soon. So we'll move on to another piece. Um, yes. Let's see. Shall shall we shall we move chronologically? Because the next one you've got is uh, the Scorch Mark poem. Okay. Yes, that one. And have you got the prototype that I sent you? Yes. Let's see. If you can find that one. Uh, I oh, there yes. it is. There it is. Yeah. Yes. Now, um, is that clear for everybody? Can they see that? Okay. Yes. Yes. Good. Now, this poem is called Plutonium, and it is part of a series of nine Scorchmark poems. And 
you might think, well, this is a very big jump from what you saw before, because there was just typed words. And here, uh, maybe you can see letters, but they are not uh, created by any kind of machine. They are made with a soldering iron onto cartridge paper. My husband is a stained glass artist, and so I um, borrowed one of his uh, soldering irons and scorch marked this piece on, onto, onto this paper. And this was the first one I did. And then the the one that I thought, well, no, that's finished now. That That's the second one, which is above. Why I want you to see this prototype one is that it does show you that concrete poetry, as I think many people do say, the often concentrates on just one word in order to bring out the full meaning and the the, the full um, potential of that one word. And at the moment, as you know, the word that is everybody is on about is global warming. And you, you just can't escape it. It's global warming all the time. And it's this awful feeling of doom. Well, in the early 70s, that wasn't the buzzword. That wasn't it. Of course, we weren't bombarded with news in the way that people are now. I mean, I have a laptop and I have um, an iPad, but I refuse to run a mobile phone because I'm a creator and I, I, I don't want too much distraction, but it, it grieves me, it worries me, especially for the young people, that they've got this thing in their hand and they're receiving so much dreadful news of all kinds all the time now plutonium uh was uh, well we we know that plutonium is an element and i think it's a, a particular kind of plutonium triggers the, uh, the, the the nuclear bomb and this series that i did uh you, you have the whole series uh in in your collection there were nine uh, scorch mark poems and uh, they are on the theme of cosmic energy and the title is perhaps a bit of a mystery unless you then you I read you read the introduction and the introduction says this is an acronym of a famous utterance by William Blake energy is eternal delight so he was celebrating the joyous, creative side of energy. So I made it an acronym, E-I-E-D, question mark. And the poems, they, they look at all the big, great energy forces, not only on our planet, but beyond. But as you look at this one in particular, I just now ask you to look at, at you can see a letter. I wanted to sh convey the chain reaction, which is instantaneous and exponential chain reaction triggered on a in a nuclear bomb and how dangerous the wrong use of plutonium is. So can you all see, I decided I would do the P as a rectangle. It's not a, um, a, a curved P, it's a rectangle. So right in the very centre, there's a tiny little square. That is the trigger for the whole thing. And then a bigger square, there's a P, an L, a U, a T, I, O, N, E, M. So then it bursts out. Can we then look at the one above, please, um, Rich? <laughs> that P, P, L, U, T. Plutonium, and then all round the rectangle, there's another big P. So the whole thing is exploding exponentially and threatening, really threatening our our, our whole existence. And so, could we now, um, Rich, find that one where I had laid out all nine pieces? Oh, that's lovely. Oh, great, great. 
Uh, anyhow, yes. Well, um, I haven't said anything about Bob. Bob Cobbing, I recognise Bob Cobbing as one of my mentors. I had two people who, again, as far as I'm concerned, I talk to them all the time because, to me, their, their, their inspiration and their spirit and their work is so real to me, they haven't gone. I mean, okay, one aspect of them has gone, but not not the rest of them. I met Bob in 1969 because I'd found out about him in the um, the uh, introduction to Concrete, you know, the uh, Hanshaw Meyer book. And so I listened to Bob giving performances on what was then called BBC Third Programme, which was rather sort of, or rather select sort of programme that people, some some people said, oh, I'm not listening to that stuff, it's boring. <laughs> but anyhow, I heard it and then I deliberately went and met him at a conference in 1969 and I showed him some of my mobile poems that I'd published when I came back from Greece called Mobile mobile poem Greece you've got that it's uh, um, got a yellow cover I'm sure you've seen it and um, he immediately um, said oh, oh I like these I like these and he, off he went I mean he improvised them marvelously and and so he and I worked together from that point of from that time and he was instrumental in getting us invited to what is now called the seminal exhibition of concrete poetry. It was called Question Mark Concrete Poetry and it was at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, November 1970. And uh, there was a, a, a very important catalogue uh, uh, came out they they produced that catalog and bob actually wrote the history of sound poetry in it so bob gave me a great deal of confidence because i worked on his pieces we gave performances from 1960 onwards uh sorry 1970 onwards and uh he encouraged me to to do all kinds of work now his work You've got masses of Bob Cobbing's work because Marvin and Ruth used to visit him. You know, every time they came over to, to, to London, they would buy from Bob. And Bob, when I first knew him, he was doing typewriter work. OK, yes, um, shape poems and uh, freeform typewriter work. But also he was starting to work um, on... Um, disrupted and destructed letter forms and he worked we were talking weren't we yesterday rich about gestetna work bob had a gestetna that he absolutely loved he flooded it with ink he used to muck about with its stencils and produce texts i have a lot of them produce texts that were splurges and distorted letter forms and he'd say come on paula let's perform these i suppose i suppose he liked uh, working with me because I, I was very lucky in that I'd been trained in music. I went to a school where we sang right from childhood. And then I had my father's cousin, who was a very extraordinary musician. And he taught me keyboard. And he he was... Uh, he had some lessons, private lessons in um, musical creation from um, Humphrey Searle that, as an English composer. And he was a pupil of Webern. So Webern to me is the equivalent of concrete poetry, but in music, because his pieces just focused on absolutely minimal sounds. I used to go to the festival hall when I was a student and they would say, right, we are going to play this piece. And it all went just dead quiet. And suddenly you'd hear, I don't know, how many just a very few sounds one or two different instruments and then there was silence and they'd say oh no they'd say, say to us we're going to play this three times oh it, it it to me that was so inspiring so bob was really keen when he saw this stuff that i was doing he said that's all right paula i love this stuff you do as much as you like 
I did uh, all these between 73 and 76, and then he published them for me using brown ink in his cassette machine. And that, that was aid in 1978. So yes. that's where all that has come from. So we had a, a, a hands-on day where everybody got to play with a mimeograph machine. Oh! Uh, Gestetner is the brand, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody got at least a little uh, experience. So these were, were they photographically adapted or were they... I, I, um, now wait a minute. You see, they, no, there wasn't much around, was there? I mean, you think, well, why weren't they, um, photocopied though? I mean, I think, what? I think, I think he scanned them in some way. He uh, scanned uh, my originals. Yes. He must yeah. have done, mustn't he? Yeah, because you there... took all the broken bits. Yeah, there was a machine, uh, called, uh, Gestafax that, <laughs> Right. You, you well, put well, the, the original on a cylinder and it would spin and it would make us. Yeah, spin. that's it. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. That's yep. how we did it. Yeah. I love, I love these. Some of them remind me. Do you know the uh, work of Olga Rozanova? Um, right. A Russian primitivist from yeah. the early early part of the 20th century. Oh, and they they were phenomenal, those people. Absolutely. Yeah. Be wonderful yes yeah. yes yeah. actually there was an exhibition at the royal academy some years ago i've got the catalog and they were called amazons of the avant-garde and nice. we saw a lot of their work in that exhibition so who else has questions or comments about this piece okay. go ahead okay uh i just want to ask why did she use this uh why did she scorch the paper or like, why did she choose that method as art, as uh, to create her uh, drawings? Well, to me, these these um, themes are so violent and so extreme. You see the one right down the bottom. Can you see that one? It's called Stockpile. And these marks all round it, they are like... Um, have you heard of Ouroboros, the the, yes. the serpent? The yes. well, it, when it when it's controlled, it 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 puts its tail in its mouth, but when it's released, it's ex it's it's a destroyer. And to me, all these dots are like a, a snake, a violent and dangerous snake. You can say almost that they're like the scales of a snake, and. As again, that is made up of the word stock pile. And you think about it, the, these poems I wrote in the 70s, dreading what they said was nuclear winter. If we exploded ourselves to bits, the sun, the sun would be blocked out and all life on Earth would be extinguished. And of course, now we're whittling on about other things, but I'm afraid the nuclear threat is still there. We're still not wise enough to invest in creativity rather than destruction. But of course, then that Shiva, isn't it? The the Indian god Shiva, uh, god of creation and destruction, which tries to balance these two energies. Yeah, I was in Berlin uh, when Chernobyl melted down oh and, my god were you uh, yeah and i i don't think i don't think people <laughs> born after that can really understand the depth of the fear that that we had of nuclear yes. disaster yes yes this is this is why i thought it's no good i can't t you see when when I was beginning, everybody, uh, if I ever said I was a poet, they would say, oh, are you? And where <laughs> are you in print? It was no good writing, um, you know, a little type thing on a bit of paper or uh, writing it out longhand. You had to be in print. And that's <laughs> the only thing that they believe. So I thought, no, no, print's no good. I cannot deal with these themes, plutonium and stockpiling. And one is called fission 
fusion. And of course, there's a lot in the news now, isn't there, about nuclear fusion saving us. But they keep on not, uh, they trying to hide the fact that when you use all these nuclear elements, you, you've got to put all this, the rubbish of it all, stowed away for countless generations. And I, I feel that is not the way uh, to work. Oh, could we go back to the, to the layout again? Because I just want to say sure. one more thing. Ah, right. Now, if you have a look at, now you see stockpile at the front. Just to the left, at higher up, to the yeah, that one, that one, that one is called Sun Power Flower. Now that's going to relate to our talk about Sun Flower Power. <laughs> We're playing with that's it, that's it, that's it. Now that's a, that's a positive one. That that is all about the potential of energy through the sun. And you can see that the S's are all within the structures. You've got all the different letter forms all, all radiating like a, a sunflower, but it, it's controlled. It, 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 it has a vibrancy, but we can harness that if we learn how safely that's the best way to go and that's what i said in 1974 that one <laughs> and here we are at 2023 but that's a hopeful one that's a very hopeful one could we just finally look at one more where your arrow is yes where the arrow is now no just to the right that one yes that one that one is magma that's the first one i did and that that one I I, I mount on a, a, a lovely orange paper, and it's circular. And can you see? There's m a, and then there's an explosion of gamma. So no, that ah, we've lost it again. Oh, sorry, do you see it now? Well, no, it was on the correct one. That 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 middle one, that that up the top, up the top, yep. just just to your right. Yes, 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 yes. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Lovely. Now you can clearly see in that one, can't you? M, A, mm -hmm. and then there's a circular with a vent, which is a G. This is one of my most performed pieces. That's the first one I did, and it's nineteen, yeah, nineteen seventy, yeah, early nineteen seventy-three. Was it seventy-two? Not quite sure. Anyhow, that was the first one. Bob loved that one, and we used to go to all these different colleges, and uh, uh, I used to show this to the students. He'd do these little mimeos for me and hand them all round. And I don't know whether you might have just a little mini go at that one. It's this again is the celebration of the globe because we are living on a great ball of fire. It's very dangerous. We have volcanoes, we have magma pouring out, uh, then they can cause tsunamis and terrible devastation. But we live on a creative planet. And so we've all got to come to terms with magma. But again, basically, I feel this one is a hopeful one. And I'm just going to do, you see the vents coming out of the M's, all mm. the all the heat pouring out and, and, and the, the magma itself, all the, the liquid rock. Well, I'm just going to give a little demonstration. And if anybody would like to join, you know, do feel free. But if it doesn't suit you, that's fine. But I'm going to have a little go at it now. Oh, 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 oh. Giga, giga. That one goes on forever.
never. I've had students go on for ages and they jump about a room. So you have to be in a nice big room for that one and dance about. <laughs> I think so. I think we got the uh, got the full effect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Shall well, we I think shall, oh. shall shall we move on to another one? Sure. Yeah, I have a question about oh, this one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Not terribly well, but have a go. <laughs> okay. I'm just wondering. Um, I think sit up there. It's either here or there. I'm wondering how you know any given piece is a poem, or if that definition oh, matters. If that, that definition can matters. Be as clear as anything. <laughs> the essence of concrete poetry is that we are focusing on the elemental particles of language. And we concrete poets say that we are zooming in so intensely on the elemental particles of language. Is This is the essence of concrete poetry. So M a g a in whatever way we wish to put it down uh that expresses this elemental energy and so it's a minimalist art does that help yes thank you <laughs> right good Another. Done. okay I, I do have a question sure that sort of leads into I'm very interested in the interplay between ancient ritual and contemporary science in your work. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, these these poems actually were created at a time when the BBC, um, it was BBC Two, that was a serious programme, uh, <laughs> that they were giving a lot of programmes about these issues. And so for me, the way that science then and now is examining the essential particles of of nature and the way that we as concrete poets are examining what we say are the elemental particles of language the way language looks and the way language sounds to me these are parallel movements parallel serious inquiries <laughs> Okay, what should we look at next? Uh, code. What's the next one? Code signs. Let's look at code signs. Ah, code signs. Yes. Um, could you bring up a page of code signs? There we are. Well, I've got it here as well. Now, again, Bob published this for me. I created this between 1974-5, and Bob, of course, he got all his equipment. Um, he got a lot of things lined up, so he couldn't do something that I just produced immediately. But this one, we he published in 1976. I must um, emphasize that Bob ran poetry, uh, sound, visual, and performance um courses um workshops that's what they were called workshops at the poetry society in its previous place which was a big old um early victorian mansion in earls court square and being london i mean you've got millions and millions of people in london he always got together quite a lot of people to support him you know uh, in the big drawing room upstairs and then he managed to get the grant to have um, spotlights and things like that um, we usually got 50 60 70 people which was really considered to be a very good um, number now I moved on from looking at markings done by my scorch mark by, by my soldering iron uh, I became deeply interested. Uh, I found a book called um, Micro Art, and it was uh, the very early stages of um, the electron photomicrograph uh, possibilities. And it meant that matter 
was could not only be seen by optical microscopes, but by this extraordinary new equipment, which of course has been greatly refined now. So I said to Bob, look, I'm going to um, trace off in black Indian ink onto tracing paper in a rather imaginative way, somewhat free form, um, all these different well, I chose nine subjects. This one is called virus times, oh gosh, it's 170,000, something like that. Um, I would like to say to you, Rich, that um, I, I don't know whether there is still a mistake in your catalogue. Um, in in this, uh, I think you've, you've got one of my actual tracings and you call it hydrax 1500 i mm. told marvin i told marvin oh please marvin no that's not right it's hydra times multiplied by tiny x multiplied by 1500 and um i'm not quite sure whether that's still you know that's that little yes. mistake has been picked up uh i'm sure it hasn't <laughs> honestly um but we'll talk about that by email and we'll get that rectified okay, for right, sure right, right. Um, now i'm just going to read you a little bit of the introduction and it says alphabets of whatever kind are surely evolved as natural growths from the infinite repertoire of markings and patterns visible to the naked eye the response to marks as sign sounds is a basic human reflex of which every baby exhibits. The intimate connection between human beings and their universe is built up and maintained by the interpretation of codes of countless markings, shapes and textures and the gradual evolution of sign sound systems to transmit the experiments. The significance of patterning as a code transformed to script is clearly seen in Arabic and Persian calligraphy. The extolling and expounding of pattern as sacred script is central to Middle Eastern art, where the artist was forbidden to copy the human figure and so became expert in making signs, significant marks, into designs. Arabic calligraphy was so sensitive to the patterner's meaning that there was no distinction arose between the communicative power of script and design. Therefore, it, the, but there is very little understanding of pattern in the West because it's often trivialized as merely uh, decorative. I then say that looking through the um, microscope and especially the electron microscope reveals to us the extraordinary patterning and coherence of the universe and so this is hugely important that we as sound and visual poets show people this patterning in the way that we interpret it and then relate it to the discoveries made by um, these extraordinary instruments of modern science and of course all these pieces Bob and I performed at the Poetry Society uh, at that period he would have um, he would hold festivals and then we would be doing them together uh, would people like to ask me anything about those I'm curious about your long uh collaboration with Bob and um, sort of how how did how did you uh, sort of did was it some you sort of immediately uh, had a sympathetic vibration between the two of you or oh. is it Sort of I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you what joined us and you actually will find a statement about this I think you've got my two golden anniversary books and the first one was called going for gold my oh god it's something about my experience in in poetry over 50 years and I describe 
how Bob and I started to work together. I was at that conference at New York University, September 1967, and um, he'd just been improvising with me some of my mobile poems, Greece. And it, it, we were at dinner, and we just finished dinner, and um, a woman came round with a big trolley and collected all the uh, debris from the tables. I mean, there were glasses, plates, cutlery, the lot. And then she had to go through to the scullery where it was all washed up. And, oh dear, there was a swing door. She mistimed it. And as she tried to go through, this swing door hit her trolley and the whole lot went on the floor. And Bob and I said, we we went ecstatic. And that joined us. After that, we got on marvellously. We we never really sort of rehearsed. We used to say, Come on, Paula. Right, let's give this a whirl. Oh, and I have to tell you something very funny. I I used to meet him first before we went on to a workshop at the Poetry Society in his ground floor flat in in Randolph Avenue. And the big um, living room, it had got their double bed up the corner. And then there's all Bob's books and publications like stalagmites all, all, all over the floor. You had to be ever so careful where you walked. Well, on the head there was this funny fluffy looking thing and I thought is that a fl- is that a fur hat because we would be and all this sort of noise and Bob honestly Bob's voice oh you go oh my goodness me I mean I wasn't but I loved it I just loved it anyhow I looked at this creature this thing this thing and I realised it was this his ancient cat. Whatever we did, whatever we did, that you know, a cat when you you upset it, it flicks its ears, doesn't it? It's got its whiskers out, but sometimes it pretends to not notice you. But its ears go like that. That cat never flicked its ears. Whatever, <laughs> whatever sounds we made, I don't know why. But and then eventually, of course, it did pass away. But oh dear, oh dear! Uh, the, the, again, that cat is one of my most vivid memories because it was all grey, and Bob loved grey. He loved all these different. You couldn't get colours at that time, and so he was so interested in all kinds of darks and splurges and all tones of uh, black to white. We well, said to me once. I said, oh, what a pity we can't use colour, Bob. He said, Paula, black and white are the strongest colours. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. Absolutely. <laughs> Have we now got to um, the Venice one? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think we have. Code Stones of Venice. This is one that I've chosen that I feel is essential for you to um, appreciate. Well, I can talk about it. Is that all right? Everybody can hear while you... you, um, Yeah, okay. Well, I I want Code Stones of Venice to be included in our uh, get-together today because um, this was, again, a seminal work for me. Uh, I'm now introducing you to my second mentor, and her name is Mirella Bentivoglio. Mirella Bentivoglio. You have some of her work, and not a great deal, I don't think, but you certainly have some. Now, Mirella is the, well, she has passed on in uh, 2017, but uh, left us marvellous, marvellous work. She was dedicated uh, to finding women who were um, practitioners of sound and visual poetry. And she came across me because she found me in the Stadelik Museum question mark concrete poetry uh, catalogue. And she, ah, there it is. She herself was also uh, in that catalogue. 
and um, we were called Open End <laughs> of the exhibition. And of course, I have got in, in my word and that uh, my little statement in that. I think there were 142 uh, practitioners in that exhibition. How many women? Eight. That made her hopping mad. That was the great challenge. She said, I don't believe it. We are creative, we women. And I am going to find out whether they're right or not. <laughs> so, of course, in those days, no email, no anything like that. Had a letter from her. Of course, I've got all her letters in the archive. And so she wrote to me and she said, oh, Paula, I'm interested in your work and I want to do an exhibition. I've got some um, um, Italian um, women protagonists, uh, uh, practitioners, very, very fine. And um, I want to have an exhibition at, it was called Centro Tool. In Milan, it was a highly avant-garde mini, mini gallery in Milan. And so she persuaded the chap who was the director, Hugo Correga, to, um, to have this mini exhibition. And there were just 15, I think, only 15. And uh, we had that exhibition. And after that, oh, she found more and she found more. And she had exhibitions all around Italy every year after 1972. And, and I was in all of them. And her great culmination was Materializzazione del Linguaggio. In, uh, that's a materialization of language at the Venice Biennale, September 1978. And she said, oh, you can't imagine the trouble I've had, Paula. She said, oh, yes. When I said, look, we women, we want our turn. I've got 80, 80 um, practitioners from all over the world and I want an exhibition. And they said, oh, yes. All right. Yes, of course you can. Oh, yes. Well, of course, the things they opened in sort of April, May, something like that. Our work was right at the end of September. She said, oh, I had to get so nasty. I had to keep moaning. I had to keep kicking and knocking these doors through. But she said, I finally did it. So I was so honoured and delighted that she invited me to the exhibition and a performance and uh i i said before to her jokingly over a previous exhibition we'd done in venice in a rather more sort of posh and upmarket gallery i said i want to do my performance poems in a gondola i'm going to be in this gondola spouting my poetry well of course they said no they, the, the the gallery director just said no no not gonna have that sort of stuff <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, dear Morella, as soon as I knew that she'd actually got the venue, it was the Magazzini del Sale. That's the old salt store, because salt very, very valuable. And it faced uh, this great channel. Do you know it? The Judica? And we, I did this poem in the sunset. And opposite, if you know Venice, was the floodlit um, uh, um church of il redentore it's absolutely beautiful who's the famous architect my mind's gone blank at the moment um palladio palladio so i said i want to create a piece worthy of this situation and it's going to be chants in english and italian and it's going to be the, uh again the stone against the water pietra dura Aquanda. Those are the two big chants. I had people on the quayside and in the sunset, all the lovely water all glittering away. And one knot would say Pietra Dora, and the others would say oh, Aquanda, because you know, perpetually threatened. The stones of Venice are are perpetually threatened by the water. So the basic text was a, a treated text of. John Ruskin, you know, he was a Victorian architect uh, and, and writer on, on um, 
uh, many art subjects. No, he, not architect, a writer on many subjects. And he wrote this Stones of Venice. And nine, uh, sorry, 1851, he wrote that. So I did a treated text of that. And then I combined it with sketches, tracings of marble of um that looked like writing to me uh, on on the famous buildings and then we we all improvise to all the um the, the reflections in the water and uh, Mirella got um, uh, students from University of Venice, so they were there, and I thought, well, they're, they're going to join in. And then we, we had um, a lot of other poets, absolutely lovely, that decided they wanted to support all this. And then tourists, I mean, we would all be doing and all this sort of thing, and I, I would be doing other improvisations with the text. And then tourists, oh, I say, what's going on? Why are we meant to say that? Well, everybody is so relaxed <laughs> in Venice. You know, people just sort of, oh, well, lovely. I'm going to do this. But the funniest thing that I remember was that some officials from the Venice Council came along and they were in suits, as only Italians can wear suits. They were sort of somewhat quite elderly people, very proper looking with their tie tight around their neck and these dark suits. And they sort of came along and obviously on sufferance. Obviously, they'd been told by the Venice Biennale, look, you've got to support this. You, you know, you've got to be there. <laughs> to start with, they wouldn't say a word. They just sort of hung around. And then suddenly... It all began to change. And the last part of the poem, it finishes with this great exultant cry. It says, Bella Venezia, Bella. And then you use the vowels, E, E, A, E, A. And I can see their faces now. These proper looking chaps, they were all putting their heads on. Bella Venezia. So performing outdoors with a whole group of people speaking in English and Italian, that was a prototype for lots of work that I have managed to do outdoors in all kinds of gardens and orchards and historic sites. And then, of course, it culminated in the last one I want to talk about, which, of course, is the Porto um, Sunflower Power. How are we doing for time, um, Rich? We've got about 15 minutes of the official class. Um, and yeah. then if, if people want to stick around a little longer and you um, have enough energy, we could go a little bit longer. But we've got officially <laughs> oh, got 15 okay. minutes. Okay. Well, well. now look, let, let's see. What, what other ones are we going to be doing now? How, how far have we got? Well, we could go to um, Sunflower Power now. Or I've also got 1980, um, the International I, Cup. I think we ought to do one of the typewriter ones, uh, either uh, Ethereal Light or sure. uh, Entwine. I don't mind which one. Let's do Ethereal Light. I ethereal like light okay lotus. yes right well that was an earlier one as i told you when i met bob bob was working with um typewriter art uh he yeah, lovely thank you very much um he typed very freely on his typewriter doing all sorts of things with the you know the, the pattern do you call it that long thing but he did always uh, say to people, I have, I am paying homage to previous people who have done typewriter work. I feel very deeply about this. If we feel that we are getting ideas from others, we should say, this person inspired me. And sometimes nowadays um well people just don't know where it's all come from and they think they've reinvented the wheel and of course there's such a history of visual poetry not only i'm talking about concrete poetry of the 20th 21st centuries but the whole history of visual poetry do your students know the dick higgins book 
by produced by State University of New York on the history of visual poetry? Uh, yeah, it's been in the classroom early on, and there was an assigned reading from it early. Oh, good. Oh, good. So they know that it's internationally, from ancient times, people have loved to put um, letter forms into shapes. It has a kind of, it, it helps you identify totally with the shape. So anyhow, Bob was doing this in, on, in a typewriter way because that was a technology that we were all using at that time in order to be in print. And um, he, he um, said, I have two inspirations. One is Dom Sylvester Huidar. Now, you have got a lot of very, very special Dom Sylvester Huidar type tracks, haven't you? Yes, we do. Oh, yes. You you have a, a, a hugely important collection. Now, I, I did meet Dom, and I actually did um, do a joint programme with him in 1979. Um, Professor Eric Mottram at King's College London, he ran a reading series, and we, we, we did a performance. Um, well, uh, we shared the evening. He was doing his things, and, and, and I was doing my things. But, of course, he pioneered um, marvellous typewriter texts. And, of course, they were very profound. They were all related to Hindu um, and very ancient philosophies and philosophical shapes and everything. Anyhow, Bob recognised him. And the other person that Bob said, well, he actually he uh, published, Jiri Valok. Jiri Valok. You, you have some work of his. When I met Marvin and Ruth in 2013, I said to him, we had this marvellous long, long, long lunch in London. And I said, oh, what news? What news of various people? And he said, oh, dear, oh, dear. Jiri Valok is not well here. I think he's got cancer. And, um, you know, this sort of thing, it, it moves you because they have contributed so much. And so we always ought to say, well, they were great typewriter people. And so I had the inspiration of working with the typewriter. Now, the technology moved on. And I think I had an Olivetti. And then do you remember, Richard, the Daisy Wheels? Sure, the Epsom... Um... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no. The, the Daisy Wheels were different than the Selectrics, but that's right. You see, in in the in the old days, i.e., when there was no computer, no computer graphics and all this sort of stuff we have nowadays, if you wanted to alter your typeface, you couldn't. You were stuck with the typeface that your typewriter had. And then Olivetti invented what they call daisy wheels. They were circular things that rotated and they had different typefaces. And so this this project, I use my daisy wheels. The, the, the were, I can't remember what the fonts were called now, but one was a, a, a lovely um, italic. And so I exploited in the poems in, in this piece um, the different daisy wheels. And also, I was very, very interested in the word ethereal. And I, I, I think I must have been, I'm not quite sure why I got so interested in that word. But I, oh, yes, I know. I then looked it up in what was those days um the 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 font of all knowledge an in, enormous double um a pair of dictionaries called the oxford dic dictionaries um not concise dictionaries I think they were called the shorter Oxford dictionaries. I mean, you could hardly lift them. I mean, I've got them downstairs. But, you know, you looked at them. What was marvellous about those dictionaries? They gave you the history 
of when words began and how they give you examples of how the poets had used them. So I was very, very interested in this word ether maybe i'd read an article a medical article and you know ether is something that gases people and um it, it's an element and uh, all its mystery had gone so i then went to find out well where's the ancient word come from a e t h e r being you know lived in greece i knew it was a greek word and it means in greek in pure greek to burn or to shine and then i looked up sort of the mythology of it all and the ancient greek mythology said that the gods didn't breathe oxygen that's for us down here <laughs> they were higher beings and they breathed aether. Um, so it's very, very special. It, it gave them the power to, to, to be gods and, and to be beyond us. And, and to express their all their divine attributes. So I then looked in this um, shorter Oxford Dictionary what poets had done. Well, Milton had wrote had written, um, go heavenly messenger, ethereal light or something like that. So I used that one. I used an ancient definition of um, the ether, which gives the idea that it, it, it transmits spiritual ideas and it's a very mystical medium and then i used um pope alexander pope's usage of of uh, uh, ethereal and and also a, a, a poet not terribly well known that's the one you've got the one you're looking at is an utterance by the poet clough c-l-o-u-g-h very interesting character actually 19th century and somewhat um connected with my college university uh, college london but that's that's how he used it and all these poets were using it in a profound sense and then of course in my introduction it just then gives the definition of ether in a very very blank way and they said well formally it was believed to be some kind of mystical medium through which light waves went but but now it, it they, they gave just a completely bald and shrunk idea and um, for me as poet i feel that we Okay, if that's the way scientists want to use words in very, very definite ways, we as poets, we must maintain the full mystery of language. So that's why you've got words at the top symbolizing the higher spheres, and they drift down in mysterious ways, and they then they, they come down to earth for those who wish to receive them then they can. <laughs> it's a really great piece. I That's one of my favorites. So. Oh, lovely. Actually, yeah. Carl Kempton had that in an exhibition. Do you know Carl's work? I don't, but oh, look at him. Oh, I'm in touch with Carl all the time. I mean, he is a great poet. And he started working in in uh, with typewriter work. Marvellous. You've got some. You've definitely got some. You've got his magazine, Caldron. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yes. And um, Marvin and Ruth um, gave him money to produce one of those. They they were a big broadsheet, very important, set up in about 1980, and um, a big broadsheet uh, to, to do big visual poetry. Oh, I've suddenly remembered, I just do want to mention my programme as well. We've got time. I want to talk about my, my catalogue, 1980. Yes. Okay. Yeah? Can uh, we go talk ahead. about that briefly? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so that's great. I'll in. just briefly talk about that and then I'm going to finish with sunflower power. Okay. Because you've seen my video, so you know quite a lot about that anyhow. But I would love to talk to you about this. Um, well, Mirella Bentivoglio, uh, I met in, I met in, well, I, I met actually, didn't meet her till 78, but we were in contact all the time, writing letters. Do you know, Mirella never stopped writing handwritten letters. She said, I'm not going to 
be bothered with a computer. I I am writing letters. Anyhow, uh, I I began. I didn't want an archive. I, I thought I'm I'm not want one. You know, they're a role of responsibility. But the thing is. I kept producing work, or Bob produced some for me, and people would then send me some. And I got more and more. And, of course, I went to quite a lot of festivals. Uh, 1978, the Toronto Festival, I met so many poets there. And, of course, I met a lot of poets um, at the Venice Biennale one as well. Uh, and, and then I did, you know, the New York, New New Wilderness Foundation uh, Sound Poetry Festival in um, April 80. So people kept sending me stuff. And I'd say, oh, thank you very much indeed. I thought I must do a catalogue for them. So this is the catalogue that I put together. And if you read the beginning of it, it, it's meant to be in three pieces. I've never actually done this, but I've got some copies downstairs. I will actually do it and do do some photography of it. But well, the first part is typed, my typing of all the stuff that I had in my collection up to 1980. And Mirella came and stayed with us in Oxford, and we we opened it formally actually at an oxford poetry festival they were more open-minded then than they are now and um then mirella was very very pleased about this now the second part of the uh, catalog it's got visuals and they're folded and if you undo the staples of the whole thing you can restaple my type bits and that's a mini book of A4, you can then lay out in a, in a, in a, a, a zigzag the all the visuals, and then the last thing you can do. I was given very luckily. I was given a helper, and it was an internship from the, the St Mary's College, Maryland, and a young man called Bob Hardy came and I said, look, I want this to look different. Would you like to hand write, look into all the books we've got in the archive, all the documentary books, all the catalogues. Can you name what it, any names you can find so we can have a little idea of how many people are working in the field? And that's his contribution. And I've asked people to, you know, you've got that bit and restaple it and then fold the cover, some of the pages over, and then you stand it as a poem sculpture or you can twirl it about. So this is not exactly a, a librarian's catalogue, but I wanted to celebrate everybody's work so that I did photocopies of lots of people's work that was in the archive. And I sent one to everybody who I posted it. There was a lot of mail art, you know, then M-A-I-L art. And so I sent it to, to people who had contributed. And I, I printed 200. And I, I, I think I've just got, no, I might, might have about, in some box somewhere about 30 left but i was very very pleased with that because it's lively and it proves in 1980 how much was going on and i, I have referred to marvin and uh, dr marvin and ruth sackner in the archive and thank them but i've also thanked i've acknowledged jean brown Mirella Bentivoglio gave me an introduction to Jean Brown. Jean Brown and her husband of the Shaker Seed House in uh, Massachusetts, they were the first collectors in America of this kind of material. Isn't that so, Rich? I'm not sure. Yeah, she was a wonderful lady. Her husband died and she was left up. So she, we all called her Mother Jean. Again, it was writing letters, 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 letters. I've got some lovely letters from her. And she invited me to go and stay and see her archive. So I took a Greyhound bus from New York after I'd taken part in the Sound Poetry Festival in April 1980. That was a big, big thing. Oh, yes. And that's all been... Um, 
uh, all revived now. Sean McCann from Canada, uh, sorry, from C um, California. He's done this terrific new um, project. You'll find it all on his website. Anyhow, I took the Greyhound bus and dear Jean met me at the station and I stayed with her at her house just, just one night. And she said, well, Paula, what would you like to see in my collection? I said, Emilia Etlinger. Oh, she said, I've got a lot of Fruxus stuff. What do you want to see her for? I said, you, you could, she's wonderful. She's the most extraordinary lady. I'd met her at the Venice Biennale, and she and I have been exchanging works ever since. And she, oh, look, there's all about her at... um. The University of Buffalo, they've got the big collection, but they I did a video for them of the stuff that I've got. And she used all kinds of very delicate textiles and dried flowers. And, and, and it, um, you would get this big parcel through the post and it would all be intricately knotted, sort of symbolic of the difficulties of life. And you would open it and then... Every time you open it, of course, the work does fragment gently. I suppose you, if you videoed it every time, you, you would see how it... Well, it's the frail, frailty of beauty. Oh. Okay, so I'm now going to go on to sunflower power, yes? Okay, yes. And, and that's um, my last, last natter. <laughs> okay, and I, I, uh, I want to leave a few minutes for questions at the end, too. So. Okay, right, right, right. right. Uh, I'm just going to have a little swig of water. Sure. I told you when I once started, I'm uh, very difficult to shut up. <laughs> um, yeah, those two, those two, that's it. That Now, you've got the artist book, haven't you? Yes. I'm, yeah, you, you must have the art. That, yeah, you must have eight on 20. Yes, because eight is a very special number. And um, I said to Marvin, I want to send you number eight on 20. There aren't 20. I mean, I I just print on demand. There's uh, very few. But anyhow, this time I went balmy with computer graphics. In 1998, that's it, my husband bought a computer. <gasps> Big deal. I'd had a star writer earlier. You know, first I'd had this typewriter, then typewriter with daisy wheels. Then I went on to uh, Sinclair, um, some sort of machine. I can't quite remember it all. I mean, it, the changes in technology. Then it was called a star writer um, with different, I think you had a few different fonts and things. You looked at the screen when you were typing. And then finally, we, we had to have one because my husband, the stained glass artist, he was asked to be, belong to the Institute of Conservation. And he is a specialist traditional glass painter trained at a very famous studio, Whitefriars, since he was a, a young man. And we were asked by um, English Heritage to do all these reports. So we had to have a computer. He, he, he bought a super camera. We used to go to these different churches with another colleague and photograph all this. And I would be the person to write off all the reports. That's why we had it. But on that, I found a thing called word art. I, I couldn't <laughs> use my eyes. You could do all sorts of things with graphics. So this one, I've got my hop copy here as well. <laughs> this one is um, one on 20. <laughs> but I've only done a handful. I forget who else have got them. I can't remember. Just a few. But, oh, yes, now I love that portrait of me. Now, I, oh, I must tell you about another person that I'm in touch with all the time who is a wonderful poet, marvellous, Fernando Aguirre. You must have some of his work. I know oh, you must have. A good deal, yes. Fernando Aguirre. Anyhow, um, I met him. He was sending me work because, you know, on the, on the grapevine, people say, oh, you have got an archive. He has a fantastic archive, not not like yours because it's different, but he has a lot of material. And he's called, he's called Archive of Living Poetry. 
and he's based just outside Lis Lisbon. He's a fantastic performer. And um, I met him at a festival in Berlin in 1978. We did a performance and he was so pleased with my performance. He said, I'm going to recommend you, Paula, to a big festival in Porto. That's Oporto in northern Portugal. It was called Porto European Capital of Culture 2001. And he was the one who got me invited. So that's when you saw me doing all those performances. I asked for a hundred sunflowers. And because the, the sunflower, it has three themes, this, this book. It's in, it's in English and Portuguese. And then there are chants. And the chants are in English, Portuguese, French and Italian to keep telling people it's a big international movement and the first one is the sunflower is heliotropic it turns towards the sun in the morning it's facing the sun in the east and then as the sun goes round the sun naturally turns round so then what about us we are heliotropic because on the whole people do get up in the morning. I mean, some poor people have to work goodness knows what hours, but, you know, in, in earlier times and earlier peoples, I mean, when the sun rises, they get up. And then when the sun goes down, they go to bed. I mean, I should have been in bed ages if I was truly heliotropic, but luckily I'm not. And with this, with this electricity, of course, we're not. But essentially, we still are. We are governed by the power of the sun. And this whole piece was triggered by an extraordinary... Oh, I saw some programmes about um, space and uh, travelling in space. And, and the astronomers said, what did they say? The billions of trillions, I think they said trillions of suns. Well, I mean, how on earth can you imagine trillions of suns? So I thought, well, I'll have a little go. All my audience are going to have, they're each going to have a sunflower. Well, they're more than 100, but um, a hun they bought me 100 sunflowers. And, of course, we did that piece in, in the theatre on the Saturday night. Oh, it was so late. They started this, this festival of performers at 10 o'clock. And I still wasn't on at 10 to 12. And I began to think, oh, gosh, I mean, I know I'm in a night owl, but how do I begin now? But anyhow, as soon as everybody started waving their sunflowers, I felt great. And so I said, everybody tomorrow morning at actually not 12. It was a bit too early for the organisers. 1 p.m. Meet me at this enormous great bridge in the centre of um, Porto, and that was designed by the um, the same person who helped Eiffel build the tower. It was influenced by the the, the metal structures uh, expertise of the time. Now Rio Douro is River of Gold, and it was oh this was all highly significant because. That took place on the 22nd of July, and according to the prof really profound astrology, not, not sort of superstitial stuff, but serious one, that is governed by Leo, the lion, and the lion has the energy of the sun. So we got onto this bridge, and I said, well, look, we've got to cut all the stalks off, the, the, the umbilical cord that we're relating the sunflowers to the earth, they've got to go, and we're going to cast the sunflowers into the River Douro. And my husband was photographing all this and, and, and videoing it all. And um, I'll never forget it. We cast these sunflowers into the river, and they, they go right down into the water. They go flop, and then they disappear for a moment, and then they bob up. And and some other people came along. I thought all this traffic as well. It was ever so dangerous and narrow pavements. But anyhow, all the uh, suddenly other people came up. Some chaps. So what are you doing? Well, luckily I I got some um, festival helpers, and they so they translated it. Said, oh, we want to do that. And and so the festival helper said, oh yes, do you? You're just the general public. What do you want to fling a sunflower into the river? All oh, for luck. For luck, they said. And I thought that was wonderful. So we cast all these sunflowers into the river and I felt terrific. And so I said, right, well, that's it. 
And suddenly, one of the festival helpers said, um, well, if you want to stand on this bridge for another two hours, it'll all come back. I said, look, I've put these into the river in order to go out into an ocean, symbolising the vastness of the oceans, the ocean on Earth and the oceans above us and what they say are three trillion suns in the total universe. I said, why Why are they going to come back? They said, you've forgotten one thing, Paula. This river is tidal. They said, all the sunflowers are going to go upstream and then they're all going to come back within about two hours. I said, oh, my gosh, I haven't believed it. You know, fate is doing funny things with me. I have made a fertility um, ritual. And I didn't, because all the sunflowers that are male in, 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 in elements have gone up the river to fertilize the earth and then having made our earth fertile they will all waft out to the sea and i then did all those visuals because fernando aguirre said look we're going to have a big exhibition next year in 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 a, in a northern part a library a library gallery very important place and he said i want you to do an artist book and visuals for your poem. And so I went balmy with all this, um, again, um, all, all this word art. And um, that that's what we did. So there we are. And, and I felt the Venice Biennale performance and the Sunflower performance are two of my works I feel so happy because we were all happy. Everybody was so happy doing all this and chanting away. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, those in the theatre that night, they didn't want to give up their sunflowers. So we <laughs> bought sunflower bread. We bought all these bread rolls with sunflower seeds on them. And we said, look, please, please give us back our sunflowers. And <laughs> Come to cast them in the river tomorrow if you want. But here's the bread in exchange for the sunflowers. So they <laughs> said, all right. That's, the <laughs> That's it. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll, I, we'll see if people have comments. And I would just want to point out that um, July 22nd is the birthday of someone in the room. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Happy birthday. Are there any questions or comments before we wrap up? Any last thoughts? No, I, no, I can't quite hear you now. I've just missed that bit. I was just asking if anybody had any final comments or questions before before we oh, wrap up. All right, right. Now I can hear you perfectly where you are now. And this must be the magic spot. I'm going to put an X on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um the archive piece um did did people document their assembling or disassembling of it like did you get any sense of whether people actually because obviously the sackners kept their copy intact um did people actually take it apart and and experience it that way oh do you mean that catalog yes no, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I haven't even done it myself. <laughs> well, no. I, I know if I... Uh... The is I've all, you see, you know, I'm a housewife. I ran my husband's small business. I brought up a child and all this work, you know, oh, I must do that one day. But I will, if I can find it downstairs. I know I've got a box from bits and it, it would be lovely to, to do that because... Um, for me, everything has multi-purpose, and uh, uh, it would be lovely to see it as 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 those three. Uh, uh, okay, a mini book. That's okay. That would be just a book structure, and then there's the the little sort of mini exhibition with a sort of zigzag shape, and and then the much bigger um, uh, handwritten one that um, Bob Hardy did of of all the people that he he found in in all our sources all our catalogs and all that and see bob advised me to buy all kinds of books do you, you surely must have a marvelous book 
All I know is it was French, and his name is M A S I N Massin, and again he did the history of visual poetry, but um, much more um, well, sort of a, what, not so academic as uh, Dick Higgins. That's an astounding book. If if you feel you don't know it, I mean, I can send you details of it. I I am pretty sure I know exactly where it is on the shelf. So oh, I'll okay. pull it off. <laughs> but listen, we're up against the end of our class. Um, yeah. It's been a wonderful experience. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's and been lovely. We'll give you a final round of applause. Oh. <laughs> but I think it's been a great experience for everyone. So, And I know yeah. it's getting late there, too. So yeah. thank you for staying up with us. Oh, that's all right. That's all. Oh, my gosh, it's 10 <laughs> Lovely. Right. Time just flows. Wonderful. Yes, it does. Right. Well, thank you. And I will touch ciao, base. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Bye.